Welcome to the first webinar of the workshop Learn to Code in Gromax. So the subject will be Gromax, GitLab, and also per version control. And uh, Sebastian Wingbermuller will introduce this topic to us. He is from the Royal Institute of Technology and is one of the core developer of Gromax. Please, Sebastian. Yeah, thanks for the kind introduction, Alessandra. And also a warm welcome from my side. So um, for a uh, molecular uh, dynamics engine like Gromax, who has enjoyed um, a contribution from scientists, programmers, and other aficionados from all over the world, um, it has become quite a logistic challenge to actually make sure that everybody works on the same code at the same time, and we don't just produce a big chaos when we try to merge contributions from everybody. Our solution to that problem is actually a GitLab server, one central server where we store the Gromix versions and all the releases that we maintain and develop. And from this server, individual developers can make their personal copy on which they code, work, and which they later on merge back to the, uh, to the server, which actually produces the releases that everybody knows and works with. Of course, I cannot give a comprehensive um, overview of what GitLab can do at all, but um, I can show you the main set of procedures and uh, commands that you need in your everyday life as a Gromix coder. And the set of commands I'm, I'm presenting here will actually enable you to get your first commit into an official Gromix release. So the, the roadmap of this video or presentation will be to first tell you how to set up and manage your local Git, assuming that you have never done this kind of stuff before. Then after coding, you would like to prepare your change or commit your contribution for uploading to the, uh, to the server, to the official one. Once you have done this, I will guide you through the process, how you actually create a merge request or MR. This MR then has to be reviewed. And once it passes the review, it becomes part of official Gromix. And therefore we will end this video with a small overview of how Gromix actually looks like on GitLab. So let's dive into the first step. So if you really haven't worked with Gromix at all, the first thing is you go to our GitLab page and make a clone of the repository. After that, you will have a folder called Gromix, which is a Git repository on your local computer which contains exactly one branch, main. But main is only the branch where we develop the future release, but we also have several active releases that we maintain and on which you would like to work as well in many cases. So um, you can add those branches by using this command here for, so git fetch origin tells git to, uh, to actually retrieve all information about the repository from the remote server. And then the following git checkout command tells it to make a copy of the release branch to which you might want to contribute, a, contribute, um, a fix or something like that. So after you have uh, used this command to set up your local git repository with all branches that you would like to work on or contribute to, you should also make sure that uh, you will be recognized correctly as the author of the work you do. And the trick is that Git does not recognize you by your name, but by your mail address. So on your local repository, you should make sure that the mail address is the same as you used to register um, for the Gromix project on GitLab. And this mail address can be, um, can be edited by using the command git config minus minus global minus minus edit. So once you've done that, you are nearly ready to start coding, but for, for a big project like, uh, like Gromix with people contributing at any time, one, uh, you have to make sure that you keep your local repository, your local git up to date. So this can be done with uh, a sequence of two commands. So git checkout again tells you to go to the uh, 
locally in your Git to the respective branch, which you would like to sync with the remote server and with the state of the official Gramix version. And then Git pull origin plus the name of the branch and tells uh, Git to actually pull the contents from the remote server so that you are up to date. And this thing can be spelled out for the main branch, which is always the, uh, the, uh, the future release plus uh, all the maintained release to which you might want to uh, contribute fixes. And personally, I always used to keep these commands in a script and then run it like once a week or if things get very, very busy shortly before a release, you might want to run it daily to make sure that you're up to date and you don't run into a, a large rebasing problem afterwards. So now that you're, you're set up, I highly recommend that before you start writing your first line of code, you develop a habit of creating a new branch for every change that you would like, uh, like to make. And also for yourself, it's good to have a meaningful name for this branch so that you later on understand what you are coding there. But it will also be visible on the GitLab server when you later on upload your change to, uh, to Gravix. So uh, if you choose a very fancy name, you should be prepared to live with the fact that everybody in the whole world might be laughing at it later on. So once, once you've created your new name using this git checkout command, you can actually do your coding. And uh, for this, uh, Git uh, provides a couple of helpful commands, um, basically like the editor commands you know, but tailored to the repository that you're working with. So Git diff, for instance, tells, uh, tells you everything that your branch has changed compared to the official version of Gromix currently. If you use something like Git diff main, our uh, git grab basically works like the standard search um, search function grab that you looks for a particular pattern, but git already knows which files belong to your repository so that you don't have to, sp uh, to specify a path, but git grab just searches the repository you're in. So like this, you, you have coded your change. You have made a couple of, um, of changes to, to the repository, but then you still need to tell Git that you're really serious about contributing this to the project. So the first step is to use this command git add, and then you can either specify the particular files that you want, or if you are lazy and just want to give it a wild card, you can add a dot and it adds everything you have, uh, you've been working on. And now this git add command has added the, the, uh, those changes to the so-called index level, basically telling Git, yes, I'm serious about these changes. I really want to contribute them. And now you can use the uh, command git commit to basically package it up into a small box of changes that you can later on upload to the remote server. And this git commit, uh, command has a flag minus M, something like minus message basically, where you put the title of your MR. And this title will also be visible on, uh, on uh, our official GitLab server afterwards. So now that you, that you have packaged your, your changes in a commit that you can potentially upload, we highly recommend that you do uh, that you perform a couple of tests. Basically, um, the main things you have to you have to ensure is to make sure uh, to be up to date with the remote repository, to make sure that your software still compiles, so you didn't break something else in Gromix and can still pass all the tests, and then you do a couple of code beautifications afterwards. If you skip or miss something in this step, don't worry. We have an automated CI that will check for it later on, but it's of course more efficient if you catch uh, these errors before uploading and keeping our resources busy. So yeah, to make sure that, uh, that you're 
um, up to date uh, with the remote uh, uh, server, you basically use the same sequence of commands you already know. You check out the branch that you are uh, that you developed in, and then you can either rebase it against the remote branch by using git pull minus minus rebase origin main, or if you have just updated your local copy and your local copy of main should be uh, should be the same as you see on the remote, then you can just simply rebase against your local copy of the branch main using git rebase main. In most cases, GitLab can do this automatically and you don't have to worry about it. But in some cases, there might be merge conflicts because you changed a file that somebody else also changed and then GitLab doesn't know which change it should take and uh, you need to review it. Uh, this has to be done manually in, a, um, in an editor, but Git, uh, GitLab has the useful feature that it can record what you do. And even if you do a mistake or have to do the rebase again later on, then GitLab knows, I last time you, resol you resolved it this way, so I can just copy it. And this feature is called reuse recorded resolution for merge conflicts. And it can be used by this bottom line command here, git config minus minus global re 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 dot enabled true. And this has to be set only once in your git and then you can move along. So now the second thing you should check is um, whether after you after you are coding, actually Gramix still compiles. And um, this is done the usual way you would install an official release. So you can use CMake for that. Um, you can direct CMake to your local branch. And then you should probably worry about four flags to, uh, to see what you actually want to test. Um, nobody expects you to, te to test that your code still works with all flavors of Gramix, but it's highly recommended you go through and think like, does my change mainly affect things in double precision? Then I uh, turn on a DGMX double. If I did something that, uh, uh, that affects or changes domain decomposition, then it's highly recommended that you use, um, uh, that you compile Gramix with MPI to test this. If you contribute some CUDA code, then please test it on a GPU and However you compile, uh, please download the regression tests and make sure that they pass locally on your computer before you try to upload uh, the MR. Yeah, and then you use the usual CMAX stuff. If you haven't uh, installed Chromex before, then, uh, then let me quickly explain that CMAX basically configures everything and afterwards make minus J plus the number of, uh, well, minus J is the number of processes that you want to use in parallel, that actually builds the code. If you change the documentation, then you should also build the web page. In all other cases, you can skip that. Um, and then the important command is to actually make uh, run the tests. So you can either do make check directly, or if you want to be more time efficient, you use make minus J, time of giving the number of processes that you want to use to first build the tests and then run the check uh, separately in this command. So in the ideal world, um, this just passes in everyday life. Um, you code and it doesn't work perfectly at all. So, um, so here are two, uh, two other CMake variables that I recommend you consider. Um, one is of course, if you run into a bug, then it might be very helpful to, uh, to compile in debug mode, to, to be able to use the debugger and figure out what's actually going wrong. This might be very helpful for coding, but we unfortunately have made the experience that it also hides some kinds of Box. So sometimes things compile perfectly in debug mode, and then you just compile the very same thing again without the debug flag, and it suddenly doesn't work anymore. So please, before you upload, at least compile once without debug mode to be on the safe side. And um, 
On top of that, uh, there are some compilers, especially the LLVM compilers uh, like Clang Tidy, that offer additional support to find um, programming errors in, in your code that um, do not really cause a bug directly or um, that do not really abort compilation, but still are not good practice and might cause bugs in the future, like not declaring variables properly or having any unused variables in the code. Stuff like this can be discover discovered by uh, um, more advanced compilers like Clang Tidy. So we uh, recommend running those as well on, on your code. Um, we have a script for that you'll see on the next slide. Uh, but if you want to use Clang Tidy, then uh, for many versions, uh, it needs the exact CMake uh, commands that you use. And for that reason, you need to set the CMake export compile commands to on uh, in your uh, compilation or installation script. So now let's let's continue right with uh, with Clang Tidy and Clang Format and all this stuff. If you have to run a, a big project like Gramix, at some point you have to also agree on some coding styles and some format to make sure that the code can be read consistently uh, regardless of who contributed it. And of course, we don't want to uh, force anybody to learn all this, the entire style guide by heart, but instead we can use uh, the Clang compilers to uh, to actually enforce this automatically. And um, yeah, this will also be checked when you upload your, your change to the, uh, to the official GitLab Gromix server. Uh, so before getting, uh, well, a negative test and a rejection there, it's highly recommended to test this locally. Um, for this purpose, uh, Gromix comes with a folder called admin that contains two scripts, Clang Format and Clang Tidy. And uh, these run the respective uh, Clang compilers on your code locally and check whether everything is fine. Uh, you can just run them as bash scripts with one argument. And there are basically two options are relevant. If you just want to get an idea what the script would do on your com uh, uh, to your code, supply it with a diff index. If, you know, if you're confident that you want these changes, then put update work dear and these scripts will format the code uh, the way it should be and that it is ready for upload. One last disclaimer here is that the LLVM compilers, especially when it comes to formatting, can be very sensitive to the version that you use. And you can check uh, the LN, LLVM version either by having a look at uh, this particular um, YAML file, admin GitLab CI, lint GitLab CI uh, YML. There, the, uh, it's, it specifies which image we use to, uh, to run the checks involving uh, um, Clang Tidy and Clang Format. And currently, it's LLVM 11. So you know that. Uh, you should install the uh, version 11 of those compilers on, on your local computer to run these checks. And the last more style of code beautification uh, check is to, to make sure that uh, you have the correct copyright. Again, this is nothing you have to do manually, but just use the uh, copyright.sh script that is provided in the admin folder. And it can be used with the flag specified here, minus minus copyright full, and then update work here, and you're done. So having passed all these steps, now it's time to eventually upload and uh, create a merge request to get your code into the official Gromix version. So the first thing you need to do is you, uh, you need to push your branch to our online repository, which uh, might sometimes also be called remote, usually it's origin. And, but for, for the commands, you can always use origin. And then, you, uh, well, after creating the final commit, you say git push origin plus the name of your local branch. Then it will ask you to type your credentials and then it will upload stuff. 
in your terminal. And after this is complete, you can go to the GitLab web interface. As, and when, as soon as you log in, you might see a green prompt at the top of your screen, something like you see here below, you push to the name of your branch at Gromix Gromix just now. And there you find this beautiful blue field where you can just click on to start creating the merge request. Once you do so, you will be guided to, uh, to a form that basically looks like this. So it starts by um, asking you for, for a title. Just use something that is short and meaningful. It doesn't have to be beautiful. It has to explain what you've done. Um, and then also please add a short description. Um, which can be used as documentation for the future. So it's it's supposed to contain everything, but in a concise and uh, intelligible fashion. So just, just like a good summary of, uh, of a book, basically. Um, so it doesn't have to be fancy, just, to, just make sure that everybody understands uh, after two or three sentences what you did. Then if you scroll down, this, uh, this form gives you a couple of more options. Um, so if you have already talked to somebody who wants to, to help you with this, uh, this commit to get it in, you can uh, either put them as assignees or reviewers. You can also assign it to yourself to make very clear that you're actively working on it. Um, if you have had uh, been in touch. Uh, if you have, if you have been in touch with uh, the team before, and you know that uh, your commit is considered for the next release, you can also use a milestone label to make this more obvious. Or we also have a couple of other labels uh, that that you can use to uh, to show the intent of your commit. For instance, if it's a bug fix uh, that you're contributing, there's there's a um, a corresponding label for that. But the, uh, the two most important points on this site are actually the two options at the bottom, right above creating the merge request. They are active by default, but it's, it's important that you, don't, uh, that you don't change them. The first one is delete source branch when merge request is accepted. So your merge request is actually a new branch to the um, server uh, GitLab repository that we host of Gromex. And as a lot of people are contributing, if you don't delete this branch, we accumulate branches. And that is a lot of basically data waste that just eats up storage and that we don't want. So as soon as, you start, uh, as your change is in, it's in the official branch and we don't need the, uh, the source branch of the uh, merge request in our service anymore. The second thing is um, usually your merge request is supposed to implement one feature, but you start by small steps and then you notice that you did something wrong or something didn't work and then you added another commit and one more and so forth. I've seen MRs ending up with hundreds of commits basically to implement one feature. This is nothing we would like to have in our official history at the end of the day. So please squash all these commits into one that we have one entry for, for your MR in our official history afterwards and nothing more. So having gone through that, uh, that form, you can now click create merge request and then you end up with, uh, with an overview page of uh, the MR that you have just created. And this overview page will look something like this. So it basically serves two purposes to present the contents of your uh, merge request in a nice way and to, um, to inform you about the, uh, the results of the automated tests that are run by the uh, GitLab uh, continuous integration or CI infrastructure. So, if we just go through, uh, if we just go through these uh, tabs that you see at the top, the first one next to the overview is the commits. 
So that will basically be uh, be a list of what you did locally on your uh, on your computer. For the test MR that I created uh, for this presentation, it looked something like this. So I started by doing what I actually wanted and then adding some minor bug fixes that I recognized during the uh, uh, while running the, uh, the local tests that we have just talked about. So while, while this is good at uh, keeping the history of your MR, uh, the actual content, the actual changes um, can also be viewed online, basically by, by, by user interface that can be described as a glorified diff or whatever kind of software you use to see file differences between two files in, uh, on your terminal. And then uh, on, on GitLab, the changes tab might look something like this. So you will have uh, one window for each file that you touched, and then you see a nice colorized div of uh, what you actually did to the code with the usual skipping of lines that you didn't touch to the next change. So while the, the contents of, of the MR might be not that relevant to you who has coded the stuff, but more interesting to, to the reviewers, there's one feature that that definitely is interesting to you after uploading your uh, your MR, and those are the the pipelines that we run uh, that we run. And the pipelines they are uh, basically the automated routines that run all the tests that um, the unit tests uh, uh, the different uh, different ways of building Gromex, and finally the regression tests to make sure that the code you uploaded still compiles and still um, allows Gromex to produce scientifically correct results. And uh, there's a set of pipelines uh, that, that is run immediately after you upload your MR or after you change, uh, you may uh, you upload any change to your, uh, to your MR. And there's a group of uh, pipelines that is uh, that will be run immediately after your MR has been accepted and has become part of the official uh, Gromex release. So because of these post-merge pipelines, it may happen that you have coded an MR, fixed everything, got it in, and just the day after you got it in, you still get a request to please fix something because something you broke was only detected by the post uh, uh, post merge pipelines. It doesn't happen that frequently, but please don't be surprised if uh, if we contact you again uh, immediately after merging your MR. Yeah. So the uh, on on the GitLab uh, web interface, the status of the pipeline can actually be seen on the overview page in uh, right at the top inside this uh, red square. And it will basically look like this right after uploading the MR because the pipeline has just uh, has, um, started. But yeah, it will, all these stages will hopefully all become green after the other. And if all of them are green, you have passed it and you don't have to worry about it anymore. But here's, here's one, uh, one request uh, I would like to make to you. Um, these uh, these pipelines are started automatically every time you upload a change to your MR. If you know you have to fix several things and just uploaded the first fix and know that several more are coming, then uh, it might not be necessary to run the pipelines before you have uh, the final or at least a, a considerably changed version of the MR. And in that case, you can just click uh, on the bot uh, on the button to the right and um, cancel those pipelines, which helps us to uh, to save resources because these pipelines are actually run on a, on a few computers that uh, we host here in Stockholm. Okay, so let's assume you have now passed the. Uh, um, all the checks, the pipelines look 
good, then the only barrier that is between you and getting your code into the official Grumix version, that's our, that's our review system. So why do we, we cry or require code review? Because uh, a complex code like, like Grumix that has to stay scientifically correct, has to be intelligible and uh, has to be optimized in terms of performance, needs more than a few automated checks. It also needs the eyes of experienced programmers and uh, passionate people to, uh, to understand whether there, uh, there could be a problem with, uh, with the code that you contributed. So for this reason, the code review asks th uh, four main questions. First of all, and the, the most important question is actually, can your merge request be understood? The best code doesn't help if nobody after you is able to understand it. And uh, actually nobody can understand, uh, can maintain code that, uh, um, that you don't understand. We have unfortunately have had this in the past and we have some parts of Gramix labeled with a comment like, it works, don't touch it, you won't understand it. But we definitely don't want to add more of this. So uh, then the second question we ask, of course, is the code in the emerge request in the MR scientifically correct? And then of course, on top of that, does it conform to our coding standards? And especially the people uh, working on, um, on performance and portability, they will make sure that the implementation is efficient in terms of performance and can be run on all relevant hardware. So, but these four questions uh, will require different expertise and a different level of involvement in the code. So for instance, the, uh, the question whether the MR is scientifically correct can be answered by an, any scientist, basically. You, it doesn't require close involvement to the code, whereas um, implementation efficiency might be something that we would like more senior developers to, to have a look at. So to make sure that both parties take a look at each MR, we have two approval groups, basically named as core and developer plus the respective branch uh, um, uh, on GitLab in the, in the web interface, you can see them actually right on the uh, overview page of your um, um, of your MR. And what you need is you need one uh, one approval from somebody in the developer group, and one from uh, uh, from a member of the core group. So because everybody in the core group is also part of the developer group. Basically, a vote from the core group, core group sound, uh, counts as a plus two or two approvals. And then you need an additional plus one from the uh, developer group of reviewers. So as, as you might already have guessed, the reviewing system also comes with a bit of politics. On the one hand, we need it to ensure code quality and it's absolutely critical there. We cannot um, get rid of it, no way, but it is often the bottleneck. So people start coding enthusiastically, then they upload stuff and then the MR gets stuck in code review for weeks, maybe months. The point why this happened is um, that Basically, people get funded to work on certain projects of their own, and then they um, they contribute review basically as, as a favor. So often there, there's no direct funding for anybody co um, pro to provide code review. So at the end of the day, what, what you would like to do is to be able to offer like, yeah, can you maybe review my, MR and in turn, I can have a look at one of your, uh, your MRs. So this kind of trading of reviews uh, is something that is highly recommended to ensure that your code can get into the uh, official Gromix version rapidly. 
but to, to be able to trade reviews, you have to be recognized as a, uh, a serious and reliable reviewer. So for that reason, we highly encourage that you start reviewing MRs of other developers the moment you start coding for Gronix. Even if you're not a part of, uh, of one of the reviewer groups and cannot really allow a merge request to get into the official version yet, the kind of review that, that, you, uh, that you provide is kind of a track record of how careful and uh, carefully and how, um, how enthusiastically you, you work on the project. And people who contribute a lot of high quality review can easily be made part of one of the review groups and then later on really trade reviews with uh, more core developers to be able to get their stuff in. And another thing that, um, that I'd like to re recommend based on experience is um, people usually think that review only happens at, at the end of the process. So when, when you have more or less coded everything, then people start looking at it and then you make a few minor changes. That's not always the case because for, uh, for many features, actually there are several equally um, appealing ways to implement it. And these designs can look equally, equally good to you as, as the coding person, but there might be some internal reasons inside Gromix why one design has to be preferred over the other that you just cannot know. And for that reason, it's highly recommended to engage in design discussions very early. And then only after you have agreed on, uh, on a design with the people reviewing your MR, you go ahead with the actual coding and then the final review will be smooth and you can actually get the MR in. So now that you have passed all quality checks, your MR is eventually part of, uh, of the official graphics release. And in most cases, you will try to target main, the branch of the next future release. So once you got in, you, can, um, you got it in, you can go to the repository site on our GitLab uh, um, server. And in the web interface, you just pick one branch and it in its history and then your contribution might be listed over here, like, uh, like the ones you see on the screen. And as we keep publishing this kind of history, that's, that's actually the reason why we would like you to squash commits so that your change is only just one entry here. And we have a good overview of what was done to Gromix in the past. If for instance, for some reason, something still broke and we need to go back to a certain point in history to fix it. Yeah, so if you want to have a look at other releases, then you basically can just change the branch. You will usually start on main as the default branch. And as you can see here, all open MRs that are currently actively reviewed are listed, uh, are listed here as branches. So that is why we ask you to, uh, to re delete the source branch as soon as the MR gets accepted because 20 branches was actually a quite low number. There are often way more MRs that are active at the same time. And if you don't want to get lost in a jungle of branches, please make sure that, uh, uh, that you delete the source branch when uh, your MR gets merged. Among these, these branches that, that you can choose, actually um, so a few of them are, are special, that those are the branches named main or release hyphen and uh, the number of a year. Those are the, uh, the official Gromix releases and they are protected branches. So those are the branches that you can only add to via the uh, um, uh, the review process that, that I've just described for uh, to all the, uh, the other branches and merge requests, you can in principle just push stuff. So no, uh, nothing's blocking you from doing that. And 
to um, to make sure that the the content of separate releases is consistent. We usually follow the practice that we fix uh, a bug that we discover in the oldest release branch that is still supported. So. Um, as we are taping this video um, in 2024, the, um, the oldest uh, release branch that is still supported is 2023 for severe scientific bugs. So if you find one of these, please code it in 2023 and put it there. If you find a minor bug that doesn't pro uh, produce wrong science, then only 2024 uh, will still be supported. So you, uh, we ask you to, to make this fix in release 20. 24. And at a not strictly defined but regular frequency, we then merge those release branches up the ladder. So we start with release 2023, merge it into 2024, and 2024 into the next future release, so main uh, right now. So when, whenever you, you find a severe, uh, severe bug that has existed since uh, release 2023, for example, you just need to create it once and upload it to release 2023. We take care of, uh, of the merging here in Stockholm and making sure that it's propagated to the uh, most recent releases. The last, um, the two last points I would like to, uh, to make are, we also document the, uh, the contents of, of releases with the help of tags and uh, um, special GitLab releases. So if you go to the, uh, to the main Gramix page in, uh, in your browser, uh, the main GitLab page, then you find an entry for tags on the left side. And if you click it, then you can see a history of tags that tells you exactly what was the content of the last releases. The page looks roughly like this. And you can also download all the artifacts, that means the actual code uh, by clicking on these uh, GitLab release. And the last topic of this presentation are actually milestones and issues. Um, but these are, are very important to the way Gromix is actually organized. Uh, so if you, if you click uh, on the plan tab on the uh, uh, on the Gramix main page on GitLab, it will send you to this. Uh, um, you will you will be offered an option for milestone. That's uh, milestones that sends you to this particular page here, and these milestones lay out when we will uh, have the next uh, uh, point releases of already existing branches, like 2023 in this example. Um, so these point releases are intended to basically provide bug fixes. And we also have internal deadlines for, uh, for the next um, official release that we are going to make. In this particular example, 2024 was not yet out, but uh, was supposed uh, was actually the, uh, the content of the main branch. And there we have three dev cycles as well that roughly coincide with the point releases of, of the existing branches. So these milestones give you the internal development schedule that we follow. And these, uh, these milestones might be moved by a day or two sometimes if necessary, but in principle, they are deadlines. And those are, uh, are the key dates that we follow during the development process. So for, for that reason, if you have particular feature that you would like to be published with the upcoming Gromix release, we highly recommend to uh, um, document your plans, ideally very early in the year, or um, even at the, at the end of the year before, in an issue and link this issue to the milestone that uh, uh, where you expect to have completed coding and to have it into the official Gromix repository. As these milestones are the actual deadlines that we use for planning, having an issue attached to a milestone is very important if, uh, to just to make sure that 
people here in Stockholm are aware you're working on this and you want this to be in the next release. Apart from, um, from attending the uh, bi-weekly developer meetings or the planning meetings, just having it as a written record to make sure that, that everybody is aware of your feature while managing the Gromix releases is very helpful. Yeah, and with this uh, piece of advice, I'd like to end my presentation. And uh, yeah, all the information I, I provided here is for sure not set, uh, set in stone. And there might be for sure details that I missed to clarify. So you're very welcome to ask questions in the actual workshop. You know, the mentors on site or online will be very happy to uh, to address them, answer them, and provide you with additional valuable information about Gromix and GitLab version control. And if you um, are one of the people who think like, oh, this was a lot of information, but I really have to do it, to do it myself and go through the process myself, um, I would like to, uh, to provide you with a small test exercise that allows you to go through all, all steps outlined in this uh, video. We have one old function that is called check atom names. And uh, it uses the old naming convention we had before and just try to change all instances of this function to the new naming convention in the Gromix source code and then try to upload this to the server as the test MR if you want to go through all the stages yourself and get a feeling of how this works before actually coding the science you're interested in. And with that, I say thanks a lot for watching. Thank you very much, Sebastian. It was very nice and clear presentation. And then probably people will have questions that I hope they have the chance to ask to you or to someone else. Okay, thank you very much. We can close.